So, have any of you ever been in a church where you've recited the Apostles' Creed like every Sunday? Uh, and, and, that's and that's fine. fine. That's, that's totally, totally fine. fine. Have, Have any, any of you been, been in a church where you've ever done, done a study, study on the Apostles' Creed? Anybody? Before I started talking about the Apostles' Creed, did anybody even know what the Apostles' Creed was? Okay, so we've got about half a third of us. Um, that's good. Well, tonight we're going to start about a six or seven week study through the Apostles' Creed, and we're going to start each Saturday evening's preaching time reciting it together. And it's almost like a, a reminder to ourselves and to one another of what we believe. Now, to be clear, Christianity involves more than what's in the Creed, but it can't involve less than what's in the Creed. Does that make sense? There are more things that, that, that this doesn't kind of hit on, but for the last 15, 1,600 years, it's been a reminder to the church of the things that we are founded on. So I'm going to ask you to do something that we usually don't do. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are, and it's on the screens, and we're going to recite this together, and we're going to do this every week together as a reminder to ourselves and a witness to one another what we're claiming to believe. So follow with me. Stay it with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I grew up, and like the only time I ever knew th these words was in a song, like a 90s era gospel rock song where they, they like made a song. What's that? Yeah, you remember that too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, when we weren't allowed, like we were afraid of all rock and roll, but we, like, Christian rock and roll was okay, and like we, there, there was a song in the 90s made around this creed. But for 1,500 years, this has been recited and used as, as a common belief of Christians. Now, there are some words and there are some lines that probably made you scratch your head, and that's okay. Like, for instance, the Holy Catholic Church, you notice the C was small, because in that sense, it just means universal church, the church of all believers of all time. Not the Roman Catholic Church, but the holy little C Catholic, big C church, the universal church. There will probably be some things that will make you scratch your head, and that's okay. We're using this, though the next six or seven weeks, as a reminder to ourselves and each other what we are claiming to believe, and hopefully a witness to one another to continue to press on. The, these are the, the core truths of Christianity. And, and like I said in the, the, before we recited it, there, there are definitely things that are left out. Justification by faith alone. It's not in the creed. But you can build the implication of that off the creed. Like the, the veracity, the truthfulness, the sufficiency of scriptures, not in the creed. But we can get there from the creed. And to be clear as well, we're not preaching this creed. We're showing... We're preaching the Bible and using that to build what the church has believed for 1,500 years or more. And it starts with this, this word, I. It says, I. And ho hopefully you all said it with me. I loved hearing you read with me, just like I love hearing people sing when I'm singing. I usually sing kind of loud. I talk loud. I'm a big guy. I've got a deep, raspy voice. All the red tide and pollen is killing me. I might have to cut the sermon early because, like, I've been scratching like, anybody been scratching like crazy with red tide? Like, I've been having to take Benadryl just to deal with red tide and to sleep. But most importantly, to deal with red tide, like, holy smokes. But it starts with this word, I. I. Now, 
if you're worried, you're thinking, well, Paul was gone last week. He said he's got a lot of material for tonight, and he's starting word by word. Like, let me just, we're going to go faster than this. But I want us to start with this first word, I. Because when we recite the creed, it's first a reminder to ourselves. I believe. I believe. I'm telling you what I've hitched my entire life to. I'm telling you the core foundation of everything that I am, of everything that I want to be, of every dream that I have for my children. It starts with what I believe about God. It starts with I. This is a personal declaration. It's a statement. It's a reminder to ourselves as we look in the mirror and say, I believe. It's where we're, we put our stake in the ground. This is where we are. Not where you are, not where your parents are, not where you think you should be or where your mama thinks you should be or where your dad thinks you should be. It's as if we're saying, this is where I am right now. Because Christianity is a personal faith. There is a corporate element as we gather as a church. We use that word corporate to talk about the gathering of the church. But Christianity is a personal following of Jesus. And it's a moment for anyone that calls themselves a Christian. It starts with a moment of belief. I believe. It's a confession of who you are and what you believe. Brings us to the next word. He starts with the word I. And he says, I believe. Now you're thinking, Paul, you said you weren't going word by word. It's going to go a little faster, I promise. But I believe believe and belief is at the core of Christianity if you look in Mark's gospel Mark chapter 1 verse 15 the first words that Mark records of of Jesus he says Mark chapter 1 verse 15 repent and believe the good news repent and believe there's this incredible story in Acts chapter 16 true story like every every word of this book is true True story, Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas are in jail. Now, some of you may remember this story. Paul was in prison a lot. Like, he was in prison for good reasons. He wasn't in prison because he was a thief or anything. He was in prison because he was sharing Jesus with people, and they didn't like it, so they threw him in prison. Well, Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're singing, and they're preaching, and they're not, like, wasting any time. They're trying to evangelize the whole prison, and right around midnight, an earthquake shakes, and it knocks the doors of the prison open. The chains fall off, and the prison guard is going to fall on his sword, kill himself. Because, like, he just assumed doors bust open, chains fall off, everybody's running free. And Paul says, whoa, 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 wait, bro, we're all here. Don't hurt yourself. You know that story, right? And the jailkeeper says to him, what must I do to be saved? Anybody remember what he said? D, go. What did he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe. We see later in Romans 10, 9 and 10, believe all throughout the Old, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, this word believe is there. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. It's important for us to know what we believe. Because without belief, there is no Christianity. Christianity is not about being a good person. It's not about some kind of moral code. It's not about coming together at church when it's convenient, throwing a few bucks in the offering plate. Christianity is is about a belief in a person. And without belief, there is no Christianity. We don't just have thoughts and ideas. We don't just hope for the best. We believe And what I'd suggest to you is that every single person believes in something. You've never met someone that doesn't believe in something. Everyone believes in something. Some people believe in themselves. Some people believe in their spouse. Fortunately, my wife wife has confidence in me, but she has not hitched her belief to me. That's a good thing. Some people believe in their kids. 
I was at a basketball gym watching my son Sean Coast play this morning, and I saw a lot of parents hitching their belief system to their kids. Some kids believe in their, their grades or their friends or their parents or whatever, but everyone believes in something. It's a matter of what we believe in as Christians. And, and to be clear as well, if, if you know me, you've heard me speak, like this word believe isn't just like, yeah, I know President Biden's the 46th president of the United States of America. I believe that. Like, I agree with the fact that President Biden is the 46th president of the United States of America. Like, I could believe that. It makes zero claim on my life except when I see the inflation in the dairy aisle or at the gas pump. It makes zero claim on my life. I believe that Alaska is one of the 50 states. But I ain't never been there and I'm probably never going there. So it makes no claim on my life. Now, I know Sarah and Nathan lived in Alaska for a few years. So it's made a claim on their life. Their belief in Alaska is very different than mine, though. But you get what I'm saying? Like, it's one thing just to, to, to use our intellect and agree with a fact. It's a whole other thing if that belief affects how we live. And when the Bible uses the word believe, it's always, always works from the head to the heart to the hands. That's how I like to explain it. That's, it just makes sense to me to explain it that way. I believe this thing intellectually. It drives me emotionally, and it works its way out in how I live. And that's the belief we're called to as followers of Christ. And that's what this creed is all about. Certain beliefs, certain claims that we make. I believe. I have hitched my entire life, not perfectly, but by grace through faith, I've hitched my entire life to this God and his son Jesus and the gospel, the good news. Getting a little excited. Here's, here's a new phrase for you that I, I, I tried, I, I really wanted to use something different instead of this head, heart, and hands thing. You've heard me say that a bunch. Here's a new phrase. Maybe you write this down if you're taking notes. When we use the word believe, it's to live with a trust-filled faith in God. A trust-filled faith in God. Which brings us to the next phrase which we must consider outlining the object or or better yet the person of our belief he says i believe in god the father like i hope i never get tired of talking about the fatherhood of god like if you're a christian god is your father and that is a mind-blowing beautiful uh, truth to claim to lay a claim to that god is our father there's like seven and a half billion people that's like three commas if i'm doing that right there's like seven and a half billion people on the earth and like he's concerned with paul he's concerned with paul because i have turned from my sin and i've trusted in jesus and i have been given the right to call him father i have believed in him and he calls me his son and when he sees me he doesn't see this 45 year old screw up he sees the perfect righteousness of jesus in me I believe in God, the Father. In John chapter 1, it says this, But to all who did receive him, meaning Jesus, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. See, there's this sense where God, God is the father of all, meaning that he created everything. There's nothing that exists without, without him allowing for it to exist and his creative order it, causing it to exist. But in a specific way, as a follower of Christ, we look to God as our father. In a very specific way that is only for Christians in John chapter 1. To those who believe in his name and we have to remember that we believe in a personal God that is absolutely involved and interested in your life he's involved if you're Christian he's involved and interested in every detail of your life a personal God 
like there's this theological system that some, some of our founding fathers actually ascribe to called deism, which basically the way deism works is it's as if God winds the clock up and he sets it on a shelf and he just sits back and stays out of the way. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, was a deist. He, he, he believed in, in, in crude terms that God wound the clock up of creation, set it on a shelf, and just stayed out of the way just to see what was going to happen. The only problem is that that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of creation. That's not the God that exists. We believe in a personal God who is intimately interested in every single aspect, in every little detail of your life. Every detail. We believe in a personal God that you and I, through Christ, can call Father. But hear me, it's only through Jesus. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is an exclusive claim that Jesus offers, that that Jesus makes and that he backs up. No one comes to the Father except through me. We call God Father because of our faith in Jesus. I used to wear belt buckles. I, I, when I started in banking, very conservative, blue, black, gray suits, variations thereof. Some of my gray suits had stripes. Some of my gray suits were plain, but they were all blue, black, and gray. I had one brown, but I didn't really like that, so I didn't wear it that much. Very conservative, white and light blue shirts. Shined my shoes, always looked sharp, wore my, sh- my, my jacket in to the office every day. It was super conservative, but... As I got a little older, I started pressing the envelope. I would wear crazy socks, and I eventually started wearing crazy belt buckles. And I had this belt buckle that, you know, like the old, like, snap-on belt buckle, you could interchange them, that said one way. And it was a reminder to me of the exclusivity of the gospel, that there is one way to the Father. It was a reminder to me, and, and I was, was hopeful to use that as a conversation piece with people. Say, hey, nice belt buckle. You know what, this is really rooted in a Bible verse, John fourteen six, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's one way. We call God Father through Christ. J.I. Packer, brilliant guy's book called Knowing God was just, it's worth the read. It's, it's a hard read, it's a challenging read, but it's worth the read. This book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. He says this, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child. And having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. When you can't sleep tonight, or when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, if you sleep well, God bless you. Let your mind race about the glorious truth of God as father. God as Father. The next word that we see in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty. We, as we, we come to understand the object of our belief, the person of our belief, it's almighty. Not some mighty, not mostly mighty, but almighty. Specifically speaking into the omnipotence of God. There are these, these words that theologians throw around about, like the goodness of God. We'll say he's omnibenevolent. He's always good. We'll say he's all-knowing, omniscient, all-knowing. We'll say that he's omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. There's these words. This, this is the other one. This is omnipresent, always there. But this specifically is talking about the omnipotence of God, that God is completely and totally in control, that his power extends over every area of the created order. Psalm 115, there's this great, if you like Christian hip-hop, there's this great Christian hip-hop on Psalm 115 by this guy named Shai Lin. It's a whole another story. It's not in my notes, but 
I, as I was typing, I couldn't I, – like I, I've got this Christian hip-hop song going through my head, not to us, not to us. Anyway, sorry, you, you don't need to hear me rap. But Psalm 115 says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Think about that for a second. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Like, none of us in this room have ever experienced doing whatever we please. Like, it just doesn't happen. Like, driving here, none of us did whatever we please. Even when we get a day off, my, my kids in Victoria are going to be on spring break. Uh, I know some others in the room are going to be on spring break next week. Uh, even on spring break, we're not going to do whatever we please because everything that we do is constricted by something. Like It might be constricted by the laws of the state of Florida, the United States of America, the city of Bradenton, whatever. It might be constricted by the laws of gravity. Like I would love to slam dunk a basketball. But I'm 45 and overweight. I've got arthritis all through my body, and I can jump so high you can barely slide a piece of paper underneath. Yeah, you laugh at that on the way home. It's good. I, I can't do whatever I please because I'm constricted by the laws of gravity. Like my dad used to tell me this story. He used to talk about like being able to fly, and he would always he told these wild stories to my brother and I when we were a kid. And I would always ask him like, Dad, when are you gonna fly? He said, Oh, the weather doesn't look too good tonight. Maybe tomorrow. Like, Dad, when are you going to fly? And, like, I had no idea what gravity, like, that gravity was a law that we can't violate. But can I tell you something? God can violate the laws of gravity because he does whatever he pleases. Like, I want to slam dunk a basketball, but it ain't going to happen. God does whatever he pleases. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name. Give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God does whatever he pleases. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Every one of us is limited by something. God's only limitation is his own character. Because we know that God is all-powerful. We know that God is always good. And so we know that he will always act consistently with his character. And it's a beautiful thing to think about. My dad in heaven, almighty. I believe in God the Father. God, my father, my father, oh my, my father, almighty, maker of heaven and earth. In Isaiah chapter 55 It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven, and do not return there without saturating the earth, and making it germinate and sprout, and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so hear, the, hear this last phrase. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Said another way, God sp- speaks with perfect consistency and perfect efficiency. God speaks with perfect consistency. He's absolutely consistent and perfect efficiency, meaning his word accomplishes exactly what he intended for it to accomplish. And that is good, good, good news. Good news. God speaks with perfect consistency and perfect efficiency. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. The next phrase is maker of heaven and earth as we consider the object or the person of our belief. God is the creator. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible starts with, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God. About 10 years ago or so, I read this blog article back when blogging was a thing. Now I think people just tweet. 
As, I mean, most blogs shouldn't be written, but I'm just saying. Most people should turn off Twitter as well, but that's a whole other story. It's a cesspool. I don't, I don't, I'm not on Twitter, but now people just tweet. I, I don't think people – does anybody blog anymore? Anybody? Anybody ever blog? I, I, I thought I was going to blog once back when – what's that? Po yeah, podcast, right, or YouTube, right? Like now you don't even do podcasts. you gotta, you got to put it on YouTube too. So there was this um, – this really great article by this pastor and he pitched this hypothetical situation where he's invited into a super liberal talk show and they're grilling him on biblical morality and the, the topic that they happen to be grilling him on was uh, uh, homosexual marriage and he's like you know I, I, I see that you find this offensive and you know, rather than talk about, like, the implications of what I believe, let's just back up and go to the absolute source of offense. And let's stop, like, picking the low-hanging fruit of things that offend you. Let's go to the actually root of why you're offended at everything that the Bible says about sexuality, about marriage, about husbands and wives, about order in the church, about the exclusivity of Christ. Let's, like, forget all this stuff, and let's go back to the very source why you're really upset. It's because... If we believe the first verse, in the beginning, God created. If we believe the first verse, everything else after falls in line. And everything else that, that comes after the very first verse is perfectly reasonable and makes sense. And his position was that if we believe the first verse, it means that God is the author of truth and we discover the truth that God has authored. There ain't no, like, your truth, her truth, his truth, my truth. There is God's truth that has been established, rooted in creation. And so, ultimately, when we have a problem with what the Bible says about sex or money or marriage or whatever it is, when we have a problem with the Bible, it's because we want to be the, term, the determiner of truth. And we're not okay with God being the creator and the revealer of all truth. And we have to see that when it says maker of heaven and earth, God is active in creation. We worship a God that is personal. We worship a God that through Christ offers us to himself as father, which is beautiful. That he's all powerful, but he's also creator. And as creator, we worship him because we are created. He does not exist for us. We exist for him. Just like Psalm 115 says, not to us. Not to us, Lord, but to your name give glory. Not to us, but to you. This is God's world, and he created it for his glory. I grew up singing church hymns. Like, in, as I'm writing sermons, these hymns come back to me. And there's a lot of good theology in the hymn book. There's a lot of bad theology in the hymn book, too. Just be careful. Some denominations have decided to rewrite their hymn books, and those just should just be used for firewood, but just saying, if you've tracked any of that nonsensical stuff. But I grew up singing hymns, and I, I think of these hymns, and I grew up playing hymns. I'm a musical guy. I grew up in band and studied music and everything and loved to sing and all of that stuff. But I like the hymns, the hymn book just comes back to me as I'm reading, and there was this, this hymn called This Is My Father's World. Anybody remember that one? Anybody sing, yeah, yeah, we got like five of us. Yeah, that's great. We're all dating ourselves. But here's what it said. What's that? Did you raise your hand, Tina? I didn't see your hand go up. James was elbowing you. Raise your hand, raise your hand. No, we're not dating ourselves. We're just talking about the tradition in which we were raised. That's all. We're speaking of the tradition in which we were raised. Well, I grew up singing out of the Baptist hymnal. And then at one point, we switched to the celebration hymnal, which was a big deal. But it says, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. I wouldn't trade my knowledge of these hymns for any of the knowledge of today's music. That's why Nicole is, is she is a bulldog selecting music that is theologically precise. Like, we will not sing heresy in this church. We will not sing Jesus is my boyfriend love song type of music either. We will sing doctrinally rich 
theologically rich music in our church. And that's the first thing I've told her for the last five and a half years is, Nicole, we need to focus on theological clarity in our music, theological precision. It says, this is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. Everything in this world was created to rejoice at the glory of God, to bring glory in him. And the birds sing at the maker's praise. It says, this is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand, the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. We've talked a lot about that. That, oh, the wrong seems e'er so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord, the Lord is king. Let heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. I could get behind that. I can get behind that. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. If we understand that God is creator with a, with a capital C and we are created with a lowercase c, that all truth is God's truth, that God is sovereign over the laws of physics and nature and science, that God is in control of the stock market, the currency market, the futures market, the commodities markets, whatever markets you follow, the housing market, it doesn't matter, that God is in control of all of it and that since we are created, we are entirely dependent on God as creator. Like, I'm not even guaranteed the next breath to finish this sentence. It's only because God allows for it. We are entirely dependent on God, the creator. And it is this great truth that we find the basis for human dignity, for people's rights, for the entire system of morality. It's all rooted in discovering the truth that God has revealed in his word, that God is father, that he is almighty, and that he is creator, and we are created. Where I want us to close is that our belief matters, but the the object of our belief also matters. And I've tried my best to point to the scriptures as we look at this creed tonight, to to see as God has revealed himself in his word, how the, the creed is built on that. We have to align our lives with the truth of God revealed in this word, that God is our creator. We worship a personal, powerful creator God in every detail of our life, every single aspect of our life is to be aligned with trust-filled submission and obedience. Trust-filled obedience. That points others to the glorious God of the universe. We live in a way, how we speak, how we work, how we relax, how we spend our money, how we raise our kids, kids, how we honor our parents, how we speak to our friends at school, how we speak to our teachers at school, how we drive on State Road 70, Grace. Every, just making sure you're still awake. Every single area, she's a great driver, every single area, here's the deal, every single area of our life is guided by this glory belief in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Will you take God at his word? That's the question I want to leave you with tonight. Will you take God at his word? Will you trust in him? pastor by the name of Alistair McGrath. So most of the references I'm going to be using as we do this series are going to be from uh, evangelical Presbyterians or evangelical Anglicans because they love these creeds. And Baptists usually say, we got no creed but the Bible. And then we write a statement of beliefs, but we don't call it a creed. That's just kind of funny to me, but whatever. What do I know? I'm just a kid. 
uh, in most Baptist preacher circles, but uh, there's this pastor named Alistair McGrath. And this is a quote I want to leave you with as well. He says, faith is not just about believing in God. It is about trusting him and allowing him to take hold of us and transform us. Will you take God at his word? Or, or maybe the better question to consider between now and next Saturday is, where am I not taking God at his word? Where am I not trusting in him? Where am I refusing to allow for him to transform me? Let's pray. Father, you are good and gracious, altogether lovely, altogether glorious. And we thank you for the love and the grace that you offer through Christ. God, I pray that would be true for all of us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Our band is going to lead us in a beautiful song called Turn Your Eyes. And as they start, I just want us to take a moment in our seat to contemplate the greatness of the God that we worship. And then as, as you've had a time of personal just meditation and consideration of the greatness of God, if you're a believer, you're invited to the back table to grab the bread and the juice and come back to your seat, and then I'll lead us through the taking of those elements tonight, okay?